everybody, my name is Drew and I am a psychotherapist in New York City. Now usually I say I'm a psychotherapist here in New York City, but this is the first remote video that I've done. Somewhere different, somewhere new. Otherwise it's always been in my apartment. So if you've watched me or followed me and subscribed, you know that I'm always doing this from my apartment. But today I am doing this from Switzerland. We are talking about the Enneagram Ones. And if you know enough about the Enneagram, you know that, well, there's all kinds of things that we talk about with the Enneagram. Sometimes we'll say that certain numbers represent certain countries or certain animals have some kind of symbolism for certain numbers. So for example, uh, with, I don't know, my number, the four, France seems to be a number that is pretty common, especially Parisians, people from Paris, a bit elitist, into art, into all the things that are great about art and very particular about art. And we know art better than you do. We dress better than you do. Our movies are better than yours. And our food is better than yours. Probably our interior design as well. That's a little bit of that four vibe, that artistic elitism. Well, the sevens, we've got Brazil. We've got Ireland. They're fun, but they're running from their pain a little bit. Uh, maybe we look at the twos, classically, the Italian mother who's doting on you, caregiving, caregiving, caregiving. Threes is classic for us Americans. It is a three country, ambition, movement forward, winning. We must win and we are proud of winning. Can we get the most medals? I think we can get the most medals. We're gonna go after the most medals. But the ones, Switzerland. It's majestic and beautiful. It's very clean. It is uh, synonymous with timekeeping. They are on time and they make watches. If you take a train around here or a bus, they're usually on time and they are gonna go on time and don't screw with the system. In fact, I arrived here from Milan a week ago. I get off of the train. I thought a bus was leaving 40 minutes later. It happened to be leaving in one minute and me and my buddy were running up to the, the, the bus and I had to get my bags on and the bus driver said, let's go, let's go. And there was this pressure, this intense pressure to get on right away. And he said, isn't this what you say in America? Let's go. But we say let's go for a different reason in America. It's that LFG, let's F and go. Let's get it done and win. Here it's more about let's be on time. You're screwing with the schedule here, young man. Let's get on the, on the bus, even though I just humiliated in front of everybody. Luckily, I had a mask on because it's COVID times. But this is Switzerland. There's hardly any garbage on the ground. And the people are a bit reserved. We might call them anal. We might call them uptight. We might call them withdrawn. But it takes a few drinks to start getting them out of their comfort zone and start playing a little bit. So... What do we know about ones? We do know that they're uptight, timely, trustworthy, and structured, and that's the Swiss. So I wanted to do this in Switzerland. So we have a great backdrop. And at times, I am not going to even be on camera. I'm just going to let you see this beautiful country, all filmed by me in the last week, to try to just give you a little bit of different perspective than watching somebody talk. That voice over the beautiful and majestic. And in that, I hope you realize the beautiful and powerful parts of you as a one. But of course, what we always have to do is we have to go after the things that are the mistakes in our lives. That's what we do with the Enneagram. We focus on the extremes. We focus on the negatives when we're teaching this. So I am going to concentrate a lot on the negatives and I concentrate on some of the mistakes you guys are making. And I'm gonna do this in three videos at least. So it'll be this video where we have seven parts and that seven is intentional. And then I do an episode on just the subtypes. And again, watch all three subtypes because you are all three. And then I do a video on the fours and the ones that both have this inner critic. So I might not go into the inner critic as much today, but I'm gonna spend a whole episode just on the inner critic. What I'm also gonna do is try to ruffle your feathers a little bit. I'm gonna read a lot of Charles Bukowski because he is just a gritty, grimy writer. And you guys have to get in touch with your bad, your rebel spirit, the dark side. 
I'm going to try to give you a bunch of resources because what do ones love? They love to get into the self-improvement. So I'm going to give you books. I'm going to talk about The uh, War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. I'm going to talk about The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. I am going to use other books to really pull you in, hopefully. Even Fight Club the movie. What can we learn from Fight Club? Maybe some TV shows that, or, or docu-series that actually push your buttons to show you that the world is ugly and will always be ugly. So I want to do a bit of that work today to really tweak and push. Now I have a joke about Switzerland and I, I always say that when I come to Switzerland, Switzerland is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been and it would be great if it was actually filled with Italians, not Swiss. Now, it's a joke. I have a lot of Swiss friends. This is my fourth or fifth time here. I've also been to Italy four or five times. And sometimes they're a little bit more relaxed and free, right? And actually, the further north you get in Italy, the more reserved and refined it gets. In the south, it's a little bit more chaotic. And then as you get north and you get closer to Switzerland and Germany and Austria, you get a little bit more of that uptightness. Things can always be better. Do the right thing. And there is an anger behind it, a passion, right? So you once have anger as fuel, but also gets in the way. Now you express it diversely, which we'll go into in the subtypes. Some of you guys are, are open with your anger. Some are very reserved and pulled back with your anger. Some of you guys have a conflict with anger. But what can happen is it leads towards a judging mindset. Where should this person be? What should this person be doing? Now, you can also put that on yourself. What should I be doing? So the moral dimension, this idea of integrity and virtue, can get you mixed up inside because the moralistic part becomes so loud. And it can lead towards resentment, subtle resentment, simmering resentment, or very overt resentment. You know, that is a compulsion for you with your anger, to resent how other people do it. So the unconscious motivation is to need to be perfect for themselves and the world and those expectations that others have on them. Now, I know that you guys are deeply emotionally complex. I don't want to simplify this and just say that you are just these uptight, uh, restrained and anal folks. But there is some rooted systems that we have to understand, some harmonic groups, some harmonic triads. You guys are part of the competency triad, the ones, threes, and fives. You know, what is appropriate, what's logical, what's sensible? What are the responses that are appropriate here? So the feelings for those types can be regulated and shelved. And, and they move towards more so problem solving, object, object, uh, objectifying for success, for successes, uh, kind of future orientation. If I do this right, I will be successful. Now, my inner critic as a four, because I'm an Enneagram four, already started spinning just there because there was a muff of words. There was a little stuttering and there's a part of me that wants to go back and redo the whole thing. But I'm going to keep this. And if I make mistakes during this whole video, I want to keep them because there is a part of us that just has to be okay with mistakes. And as a four, I very much understand that. Our inner critic is also very loud. There's some rules that I want to follow internally also about how to aesthetically and performance-wise, get things perfect. So you guys are part of the competency triad. What else? You're also part of the dependent, compliant social stance. So along with twos and sixes, you tend to be uh, those types of folks who will defer to authority, who will often let other people dictate how things go in their lives difficulty taking independent inventory and independent roles. You live very much in the present and you repress thinking. It doesn't mean you're not a thinker because ones are definitely thinkers, but in the moment 
you defer to this uh, kind of natural system within that goes to what am I supposed to do here? It's not as a spontaneous, instinctive, a creative. It's very restrained. And so why you are industrious and you do have these to-do lists and, and, and the internal critic is working on your behalf and against you, there is an emptiness there of fluid movement. It's, it's a kind of a habitual impatience with self. And then because of that, there's a lack of in the moment solutions. Now ones can kind of be in and out of that where sixes can be really paralyzed. So take note of how much failing uh, and falling are things that are preoccupying your mind. Now I wanna dedicate this episode to my college roommate of three years, my best friend in college and a good friend still to this day, 20 years later. Now he's an Enneagram one, I'm an Enneagram four. We didn't know this about each other back then. We were just naive, ignorant kids. And there was this kind of compensation that was happening. I was fun, I was a bit more of a risk taker. I was also melancholy and prone to depression. Uh, I was moany and gro you know, groany, but I was also able to go out and be the life of the party. I was able to get him in trouble at times because I would be the one who would wanna do stuff crazy on campus. And he was a bit more held back, constrained, um, disciplined. And this helped me actually find the balance between being too much and the right amount. And the same for him, getting in touch with his feelings, getting in touch with the ability to communicate where he's at and find his true self, find the authentic, unique, creative parts of himself. We really have helped each other over the past 20 some odd years do that. And so I've gotten to watch him grow over the years and become a healthy one. I also have a client right now that I'm working with who is a healthy one with the initials JC. Now, he ain't Jesus Christ, but he wants to be in his mind. And, and so this is also for him because he really represents that part of a grinder, just so much self-help, so much working on self. And the part of him that needs to grow now is the part that actually just knows he's working really hard and can relax a little bit. The one's intentions are usually really on point. They want to help, but sometimes they get in the way because of trying to do it the right way, which can get in the way of doing it an interesting way, more concentrated on content and not the process. So this is what my college roommate had to say before I did this. And he just, he just sent this off because he knew I was going to speak about the ones. He said, I'm in a place right now where I'd really like to know the hard truth of what my closest friends think and see. Although it's tough for me to ask someone to take time to give me their opinion, not because I don't want to hear it, because I feel weird asking about something that is about me. Now there is this a desire to avoid critique, avoid needing support, to excel and be excellent so that you can find worth, be prepared. And so we're gonna try to really dig deep this seven points that I'm gonna play out. My name is Drew again, this is Switzerland. I'm gonna try to change the scene up a little bit for you and also be a little bit more creative than I've normally been. It's usually just been me and the camera. And I want this to be an example for you of being more comfortable and creative with yourself and finding a different way to look at life a little bit. So sometimes I'll be talking with actually video playing, a little voiceover. Hopefully that doesn't become too distracting. If you want to work on yourself individually for a short period of time or long period of time, get in touch with me on my socials, either Instagram or my website at drew at drewnewkirk.com. And let's get into it. Hope you watch the subtypes. Hope you watch the other videos and learn the other numbers. And uh, I hope you go on this deep dive journey into the ones. All right, guys. So you are obviously the perfectionist. That's the title that's been given to you. But some people call you the reformers. 
I like to even call you guys the fixers. I have so many friends that use the word fix, fixing this, fixing that. You know, they see the bigger picture and, and they want to hone into the details to really dig deep in and see what can I enhance and develop and refine. But there is this need that I must mitigate my feeling of being irredeemable at some level. So I've got to work extra hard to work against this part of me that feels like I don't deserve enough. So in that, we know that there is a need to feel that I am right. That makes you feel very secure. I am right. And in that, there is some control. When it goes too far, it becomes the moralist. It becomes the, the person who is righteous all the time and is always finding the flaws in others. And in that, there is an absolutism and an arrogance that follows. So what the one might do is look for where in the world do they get some reciprocation? That there's a meritocracy here, that I am going to get my worth by doing the right thing, and I'll get the feedback that I need in response, but the world doesn't really work like that, does it? So this idea of a quid pro quo, or I get because I did the right thing, I earned it, and I'm going to keep account of everything that I do, will end up working against the one. But we cannot discount this idea that they are puzzle fixers. They can put the puzzle pieces together, that they are problem solvers. And their impatience, while it doesn't work for them all the time, does work in the sense that they can really attack a problem and then develop and refine. I'm going to make the world a better place. But they have to watch out, you guys, of making the world what you want it to be. That is where you will get into your problems. So I know you ones pay special attention to detail. And we need folks in the world like you who are so exacting with your eyes and, and want to fix those problems. But when we have this word perfectionism, it obviously could be a negative connotation. So I want you, when you think of the word perfect, to think of the word complete or whole. So I am going to have seven parts here. And I'm using the, word, the number seven intentionally because in scripture or in wisdom culture, seven is a very powerful number. It's a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of completeness. In the seventh day, there was rest. This idea that it is now complete. I can take a break and breathe. And that is the sign of spiritual maturity is knowing when to stop, knowing when to pull back, knowing when to be a bit more practical, um, to use your awareness and intuition, and then put those together for wisdom's sake. So in the Hebrew culture, this idea of the number seven is an idea of fullness, perfection meaning completeness. You ones got to chill out a little bit. You already work so hard. My clients who are ones, or my friends who are ones, often I have to do say, dude, chill out, take a breath. You're already working on your stuff so much. You're a bit of a freak about self-improvement. And there's a point at which you're putting too much in. And you're working for things that you already have. You're already good at. You've already put the necessary amount of energy and time into so I know as perfectionists, you don't often see that because you're looking for safety and security over threats in the world. And that's understandable. When you were probably young, you had to do that. You were living with certain shoulds and oughts that might have been put onto you, or maybe somehow you just uh, injected those into your system. That the desire to improve everything overwhelmed you. So when a client comes to me and we have talked about things endlessly that they know deep here and they've worked on and they're still totally anxiety prone about like, oh, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? We have to take some of that burden off, take a beat, chill a bit. There is unnecessary burdening and that's what you have to watch out for. Move towards completeness, which is 
a tenderness with self, a softness with self, gentleness, because you guys are already pushing the pace so much. A lot of ones don't get to do what they really want to do because they are trying so hard to do what is expected of them. That inner voice inside, which is so loud, that inner critic is relentless, forceful, harsh, and punitive. And so it gets in the way of them and their true self. That is the goal here. So what is the true self? What is, what is the person that was there before these voices got too loud? Before the world told you who you were meant to be, who were you? The inner critic is always getting in the way of you and your true self. And I, as a, a four, knows this. We have a very loud inner critic as well. And ours is more about being this authentic self, this original character. And yours is more about doing right and wrong. Now, I want to go deep into that, but I'm going to actually save some of that for a video I'm going to do that really looks at fours and ones and that loud voice that's inside. So I hope you watch that as well. But I ask you this, when did you first notice the voice? How harsh is it? When did you start talking back to it? Have you started talking back to it? Have you built a relationship? It doesn't often require you to be so angry at it, but sometimes that helps to just push back on that inner voice. Talk some shit to it a little bit. Put it in its place. It is not the voice of reality. It's false. And so can you find some reassurance and strength and some truth and some kindness to yourself by talking back to the voice. The inner critic is always lying. I, I love the book by Stephen Pressfield, which is the, uh, the War of Art, not the Art of War, the War of Art. It's another one of my suggestions for you. And I'm going to constantly be giving you suggestions because I know you're so self-help involved. And he talks about resistance there is a, a, an inner voice that is talking shit to us. That is not the truth. And we have to push back on that. The voice protected you early. It made you upright and, and doing the right things, probably in an environment that you needed to follow the rules to get the love and attention you needed. But now it is punishing you and again, it is getting in a way. It's oppressive and crushing. And it's requiring you to disengage from your true self. And that will never be something that is right and good. So this is the initial challenge to you. As we think about these seven areas, one being perfectionism or in the healthy way, completeness, that you look for the ways you can get closer back to your true self. If that is not serendipitous in the background, I don't know what is. Church bells saying, get back voice. It is our time to take over who we are again, and be our true selves. And because of that, and, and in that movement, you might have to do some things that are really hard for you. So we'll get into that as we go on, move on in these seven. All right, guys. All right. I want you to sit back and relax and enjoy this fire I'm going to make for you here in Switzerland. And right now we're going to talk about anger. And there's no better metaphor for anger than fire. Throughout history, artists have used the language of fire to exemplify how passion and desire can be used to fuel us. And when I think about that, I know that anger is such a crucial component in that combination. Now, unfortunately for ones, a lot of the desire part of your life was stolen from you. In many ways, a lot of ones have grown up with an environment that resisted you looking at what you wanted. 
It was more about rules and regulations, or you had to take a, a seat of responsibility earlier than you were supposed to. And it makes it particularly tricky because you're part of the anger triad, the eights, the nines, the ones. The eights overdo anger. The nines underdo anger. And you tend to be in conflict with it. And the reason artists have so used the idea of fire is because artists tend to be singular. They find their unique personal accent and how to use it in the world. Charles Bukowski says, what matters most is how well you walk through the fire. Bruce Springsteen talks about being on fire, finding the fire within. In the Bible, there is this idea of of the fire that does not consume us, but is used. Moses sees the burning bush that isn't burning up. It's not consuming the bush. And so many ones, like most of us, have this weird relationship with with fire where we we think it's a bad emotion. And we put it in that category. And we need to know that it is not bad innately. It is meant to be used to our benefit and to the benefit of the world in that we're using it for purpose. If we don't use our anger well, we're not aware of it. We're not familiar with it. It will go into the shadows. And when it goes into the shadows, it becomes hidden to us, but it will seep out. And so you self-preservers, you tend to hide anger the most. The social type, you, you have hide it. And the sexual type, you don't hide it that much at all. But in each way, the maturity in which you use it will indicate how you move forward in missions in life. And how your relationships will be either healthy or unhealthy. You ones can tell us what we're doing wrong. And when we tell you what you're doing wrong, it can often crush you. And so that's a really tricky dynamic to play out. Because your anger, if it's not truly um, familiar to you, could be very dangerous. I know in my own life, I've told you before about my best friend from college who was my roommate, who was a one. And, you know, in college, we're in our 20s and we don't have that much maturity with our anger. I, as a four, did not have much maturity with my anger at all. It was a bit more wild and explosive as a sexual four. And my roommate's was a bit more restrained and passive. I think probably more on that self-preserving social side. You know, where it's half hidden and or put away and it's going to come out as a volcano later. Ones are constantly playing the game of anger and avoidance. Anger and avoidance. Avoiding the anger and then having the anger. And it's seeping out and it's bubbling up. That back and forth can be pretty turbulent for you and you beat yourself up over it. Maybe the sexual type the least, the self-preservers the most. But there is a certain denial that a lot of immature ones will have with their anger. In a sense, disowning it or or feeling like they don't even have it. Maybe using the words annoyed, irritated, frustrated. I have to tell you that those are in the category of anger. Most definitely. The category of anger has hundreds and thousands of words to express anger from peeved to rage-filled. And when we are in denial about it, we don't know which one we are accessing. So even with my clients, what I'll give them is a a feeling sheet. And in the category of anger, there's all these words. And they might tell me, I'm not angry. And then I say, well, can you pick five words in there that best express you? And they can easily do it. But they would have never defined those words as anger words. They might think, as ones, you might think, that, that you are just trying to help out. But what we experience on the other side is hostility. And when you are really bad at accessing it, sometimes it is like a beach ball being held under the water. And when it pops, it could be volcanic. I like to call it Jekylling. You know, there's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Jekyll is the doctor and Mr. Hyde is this character that gets to play out all the bad parts of what Jekyll is experiencing inside. Now, The monster, the Hyde, is the obvious bad guy. But Jekyll is trying to 
restrain himself so much. And you ones can definitely do that. So think about the hostilities that you have. They often look more like resentment. You know, I'm working hard over here. I'm doing the right things. You fours, you sevens, you eights, you threes, all you cats that are doing things that are outside what I think the boundaries are and getting away with it frustrates the one. So resentment is a kind of replaying or a resent message back to you over and over again about what's not going right with the world. And it could be oppressive to you and invasive. And then it becomes oppressive, invasive to the others because it's going to seep out of you. Usually with the ones, the closest people to them get the heat. Even when you're healthy, you know, you might give the heat to the close people in your life. And so therefore, you even can think about this and look at your body being uptight. You know, ones often get that that definition, being uptight, it really means to be tight. In a sense, be strained. And this is how anger sometimes takes over a one. But this is your passion, right? And you have to chew on your sin. That's what the Enneagram teaches us, to chew on our sin, to understand it deeply. And you have to understand anger better than any of the other numbers, (laughs) Maybe that's not true, but, you know, I'm trying to overemphasize this for your benefit that you have to be so familiar with this passion. It's, it's a core mode of, of force in your identity. And so to be conscious of how it's driving you to deal with reality, you know, a lot of ones will push away reality. They are in opposition to what is happening around them. You know, the world is really hard and ugly and met, must, uh, messy and gray and muddy. And ones have a difficult time with that. So they have to go against what is hard to accept. And the anger helps them just be frustrated with the world. This world rubs me the wrong way. But the world will always be flawed. And so when you are moving from your vice to virtue... From anger to serenity. I like to say serenity now. Serenity now. It's from a a Seinfeld episode where George's dad finds this way of trying to deal with his anger by always saying serenity now. Serenity now. It's actually an Enneagram truth that you need to move from anger to serenity. Being calm, relaxed, slow. Slow to criticism, slow to judgment. And finding a bit of freedom and looseness to be a little more open, light, not so restrained. To put the relationships you're in over the critic. Relationships to be priorities, not criticism. It's that idea that you can be right or you can be married or you can be right or you could be in a friendship. And it also where to appropriately direct your anger. Remember that hostility and resentment are going to be with you. You probably die with it because you just have a, a, a heavier a dose of it activating and being a burden on your life. So if you know where it comes up, you can also know the appropriateness at which you need to find your crosshairs and where to aim that anger. This is part of the work. And so I think here's some things you can do specifically when you're thinking of anger. What is the purpose of my anger in this moment? What's its intensity? What will be the duration and how will I distribute it? Do I need to leave an environment for the environment to be safe? And I want you to grab real delight in your anger. It's so useful. It's so useful to have that fire. Again, it's what makes artists great, for example, that they they find the way to channel it. It is beautiful. We all have anger. And it's all there to help us do things effectively. So let's think about just finally, 
Old scripture, Jesus in John 2, 15, it's the only gospel that talks about this. Jesus goes into the temple. He's pissed off at what's going on there. He leaves the temple and he fashions himself a whip, then goes back in and then pushes things around. Not just animals. It's a bit more broad than that. But there is deliberacy. There is some kind of intentionality with going and using whip. We don't know how long it takes to whip, take a, make a whip, but we can tell that there is something within Jesus that is very intentional in this moment and that he is contemplating it. How will I use this anger? So you ones have to do the same thing. I hope you've enjoyed this fire. We're going to shift over. But I just wanted us to have this meditory, meditative process concentrating on something that is actually dangerous, but beautiful. Hot, but useful to our warmth. And very purposeful for the sake of humanity. Fire does that for us. And it can be utilized in the same way for you. All right, on to the next thing. Okay, this next part is called Upright Citizens Brigade. Upright Citizens Brigade. Okay, track with me here. It's going to be a roundabout way of going at this, but fours and ones have a lot of connection points. And we'll find that out more when I talk about fours and ones together in a separate video. But, but just for this part, let's talk about how fours have a way of breaking away from what might be conformity, especially creativity-wise that they take the boundaries and they remove them at some level. And they tap into their imagination with deep passion towards expression. They let the rules be rules for certain people, but for themselves, they find their own rules because they find the rules that fit for them. And I understand this. Rules at times can be hard for me. Uh, even systems, modalities, I like to play by my own rules. I giggle at conformity at some level, and, and I don't have as many narrow line, lanes. I open things up a bit. But ones and fours can both procrastinate because we are idealists. We want things a certain way. So you guys want to do the right thing. We want to imagine and orient the world with expression. That's our ideal. So we both have to slow things down to speed things up, which sounds counterintuitive. We have to actually allow ourselves to not be in a perfect place or a perfect world. Soften the edges we have and the constraints we have. Like I might move too much towards open spaces and a lack of conformity. And you as a one might move too close to conformity and boxing yourself in. Now, a, a quote that really resonates with me, again, we're using Car uh, Charles Bukowski as a bit of our guide here. He says, I don't like the clean shaven boy with the necktie and the good job. I like desperate men, men with broken teeth and broken minds and broken ways. They interest me. They are full of surprises and explosions. Okay, why do I bring up that quote? I bring that up because in comedy specifically, we need a certain amount of lack of control, of things being dirty and messy and broken teeth and explosions and surprises that can happen. But the interesting thing is we also need rules. So once you have the rules, fours, we have the open fields, the expansiveness of possibility of surprises, of explosions. We're willing to let a lot of things happen. Now, I want you ones to get in a moment here where you can just start to feel discomfort. What would it like for you, for you to be humiliated regularly? And I don't mean like somebody just humiliating you by making fun of you, but for you to get messy for you to move towards that progress we talked about before, which is chipping away slowly and methodically, but also still use your ability to have instincts, intuition, body knowing, which ones do. They tend to be really connected to their body. 
They use their energy to create boundaries and shape environments. So while they suppress impulses and desire, they still know what is right. And that requires some intuition. That requires knowing what's going on in your body when you feel something happening. They very much live in the moment. They might not think quickly, but they do know systematically what's right and wrong and how to fix something. And what I mean by not thinking quickly, I don't mean that you guys can't think well. I mean, when it requires a little bit more creativity, a little bit more tapping into that stuff that's serendipitous and uh, quick motion and uh, witty. What I want to go into now is not going to sound intuitive, but it is what I talked about before, the Upright Citizen Brigade. The Upright Citizen Brigade is a school. It started as a troupe, an improv troupe. Amy Poehler was in that group. Then it became a school. They started teaching improv in New York City. So you ones can actually be pretty funny. You know, you guys can be pretty dry with your, your humor. You can also throw things out there when nobody expected it because sometimes you're not expected to be the funny one. But I found that a lot of ones have humor and it comes out at some really interesting times, especially when I have not expected it. Now, I do think sometimes it's hard for someone who hasn't had very obvious pain in life to be funny. I don't know why that is entirely, but I think true deep suffering often has humor as a resource. You know, you're looking at the world and laughing at yourself, being willing to say, I'm a joke at times. Life is a joke, but, but ones take their life pretty seriously. And so a lot of their pain isn't obvious. Now, a lot of the ways you guys have learned how to defend yourself in the world is by being upright, by being a good citizen, by following the group, the brigade. So, so why I'm using this here is that that kind of tightness doesn't sometimes allow for humor. You know, to people who have to-do lists and are concentrated on duty and responsibility aren't often hilarious. But I think ones and fours can both try too hard with humor. I've seen ones who try to be humorous and therefore they're not. So when you are not trying too hard to be humorous, that's actually when you can be humorous. So I, I just wanna give you a little backstory here. When I turned 35, 36, I was starting to come towards 40. I started thinking about some things I wanted to do to challenge myself. So I think when I was maybe 37, 38, I started taking these courses these improv courses, and I took two rounds of them, and it was very difficult for me. It was a daily experience of being humiliated, feeling stuck, and one of those reasons was because improv has rules. This is where you ones could probably thrive. There's very specific rules you follow to actually keep this, this movement of a skit or, or, or these components of um, stories. And so what we have to do in improv is overcome the ego. There's so many desires wrapped up, desire to be funny, desire to stand out, desire to be uh, in command and not look foolish. And our ego is small and cramped and our true self is spacious and free. And when we are trying too hard, our ego is to engage. So one of the challenges of improv is to loosen up, to like understand what's going on in your body, which, which sometimes you guys are good at, but also not try too hard. So here's a, a, a passage from a book we had to read for that, which is called Truth and Comedy by Del Close and some others. Del Close is considered kind of the godfather of improv. And the quote goes like this, deliberately trying to be funny or witty is a considerable drawback and often leads to disaster. Honest responses are simpler and more effective. By the same token, making patterns and connections is much more important than making jokes. The truth is funny. Open yourself up. 
As Steve Martin says, comedy is not pretty, it's messy. And this is where the ones have to be challenged. You guys are good at following the rules and you'd probably be good at following the rules of improv. But can you allow yourself to be messy? Because in comedy, honesty is the best policy. Now, again, you guys are, tend to be honest, but you also tend to be protected of looking bad. So one, be honest. Two, don't go for the joke. Three, there's nothing funnier than the truth. This is where you'll have to be comfortable with your broken, messy stuff. Jokes aren't born out of de des uh, desperation. And so because fours and ones are so desirous of, of being perfect in a sense, in different ways, of doing the right thing in different ways, we can force things, force humor, force movement, and not be slow and patient. You know, for the one, idle hands are the devil's playground. But in comedy, and especially improv comedy, we have to force and foster a slow movement, progression, letting something build, you know, disengage from our need to do it right and allow things to be organic while still following the rules. So why the four might be possibly able to do the organic, the one has to follow the rules. And when we put those together, it could be a really beautiful blend. And the truth in comedy, it says this too. It is easy to become diluted by the audience because they laugh. Don't let them make you buy the lie that what you're doing is for the laughter. Is what we're doing comedy? Probably not. Is it funny? Probably yes. Where do the really best laughs come from? Terrific connections made intellectually or terrific revelations made emotionally. And then they use this Roman phrase, ars et est uh, salare artem. The art is in concealing the art. This is really hard for folks like us who have an internal voice that is demanding and persistent and oppressive. It corrupts us in the moment and it's too loud. And so improv comedy for me allowed the voice to diminish to trust a bit of the process, the rules, and then that organic flow between people where we're just being truthful and sharing a narrative and the narrative will be funny. And this is a challenge to you with just your friends and your family and your coworkers. When you're trying too hard, it doesn't work. And in the comedy sense, it's not funny. When you're allowing things to be progressive, when you're allowing things to chip away, when you're allowing things to come at you slowly and methodically, that's when we can be our true self, slow down and allow the thing to take form. And that's what is great about improv. It slowly takes form as we say yes to the moment and we don't allow, allow the inner voice to be too loud and get in the way. So this is like a weird challenge I have for you guys to even think ones about how you try too hard, maybe in comedy with friends or in any day life that you're trying too hard will allow maybe you to feel safe, but won't allow uh, kind of an appreciation of something unfolding unfold slowly and methodically. Cool. All right. On to the next one. In this section, I'm going to talk about lost childhood. And again, I'm going to use Switzerland as our backdrop. Take myself out of it and let you just experience in awe the beauty that is here. And that's what we have in childhood. Awe and just a reverence for this bigness that's there. And when we have the right people in charge, when our parents are very generous with their warmth, and their attention to us, we can really experience the bigness of the world without too much overwhelm or trepidation and a certain type of camaraderie and partnership. But a lot of ones did not feel that. They had to be little adults very quickly for a number of reasons. 
Often they had parents that were withholding of words of affirmation. They might have been moral peddlers. And by moral peddlers, I mean they were constantly peddling this idea of righteousness, of doing the right thing, of being perfect. They were perfection pimps. (laughs) They deal in dissatisfaction and disappointment. Maybe at the dinner table, I have a a bunch of ones in my life who say at the dinner table when they were kids, they were meant to be seen and not heard, and they better have had their manners in check. And so there was a kind of coldness and detachment they had from their parents, a deprivation. And there was an expectation put on them. But what they really had was this hope or expectation that their parent would envelop them a bit more and be a bit more understanding And give them the space to be kids. They often felt criticized and then took that voice internal. So there was a kind of parentification. They were made to be their own parent and very strict parents of themselves. Now, some had a bit more of a wild background or or maybe something that felt a little bit less safe. And so they had to step up and be grown, not because they were constantly told to do this and that, but because they had to be the own own subject of their life as the parent, to parent themselves. And some had maybe been put in the position to be the parent in the house and or be the spouse. I have a client who tells me of a story and we've constantly been working on it that the parent, in a sense, put him in a position in which he had to become the husband. And it was really confusing to be in that position. And it can really damage a person, not just emotionally, but sexually and psychologically. And they can't be a good parent at that age. They can't take that role effectively. So what did you learn in your childhood? And how do you go work with that child now, today? How do you have fun with that kid inside of you? When I did the eights, I had to talk about the eight going back to talk to themselves because similar things happened to them, maybe in a different kind of slant. But they had to find that youthful, softer side within themselves. Because otherwise, like eights, you ones, could become dualistic and binary in your thinking. There's a good book out there. It's old, but it's one of the goodies. The Drama of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller. And in the book, she talks about how the parent has made the kid too responsible and put too much pressure on them early. And so the child has maybe some kind of thirst for revenge, That the parent was too demanding and unconsciously the child resists or acquiesces but is burning inside. Something is dying inside. And for the ones, it looks a bit more like this, right? Because you guys are either dependent or cooperative with the authorities. And so your rage or revenge had to go underground. And often, right, it was taken out on yourself. To avoiding losing love, you take the pain out on you. And maybe where an eight rebels, you comply. So this costs your emotional development. And you even had to avoid depression because it wasn't allowed to be something you accessed or felt. That you're weak if you are feeling sad. So listen to to Alice Miller's words. A child is at the parent's disposal. The mother, in this example, can feel herself the center of attention, for her child's eyes follow her everywhere. A child cannot run away from her as her own mother once did. A child can be brought up so that it becomes what she wants it to be. A child can be made to show respect. She can impose her own feelings on the child. This is true for a lot of ones. They, they tell me about stories of their parents being very strict and regulated and wanting them to be a certain thing. But it was about the parent, not about you. So where was the expressive and creative self killed or diminished? 
You must find that self again. You must find the artist, the creative inside of you. The true self cannot thrive or develop under oppression of perfection. It can't. So I'll even tell you this. like Maybe you go practice art, but do finger painting. Yeah, it would feel awkward as, mm, you know what I'm talking about. Play with paint. Have fun. Run around in a field naked. I don't know. Find the way to stretch a bit. Recover the child. Much like the eights, you guys have to do that. This is hard work. And be appreciative of the affirmation you get today. Receive it almost like a child. And allow it to warm your heart the way you wanted it to with your parents. The part of yourself that was neglected and lost must be reclaimed. The defense against undesired and inappropriate emotional restraints is often to take it out on ourselves. We have to start enjoying ourselves. You may die with that internal voice being very loud, but if it can also push you to be creative and and find the child inside of you that is much more free and unhindered and unbridled, that can be a great part of yourself. This is the seven within you. I'll leave you with Alice Miller's words here. It is precisely because a child's feelings are so strong that they cannot be repressed without serious consequences. The stronger the prisoner is, the thicker the prison walls have to be. And unfortunately, these walls also impede or completely prevent later emotional growth. It is not lost on you. You can go back You can start trying to nurture that child who was too hedged in. And that's my call for you, to do that and to do that well. And just enjoy the awe of this world, the awe of the mountains, the awe of the nature. Let it be beautiful and let your child side just be excited about it. This part's called The Brother. Now, this is about the prodigal son's brother. In the book, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nouwen, which I read when I was in my early 20s, it really had an impact on me because it was about Rembrandt's art piece, The Return of the Prodigal Son. If you know anything about the prodigal son's story, then you'll track with me. If you don't, go look it up. Familiarize yourself with it. It is about, essentially, a brother who does all the wrong things. And really wastes the family's funds. And then takes off and lives a life of debauchery. Why the older brother stays home and is responsible and does all the right things. Now, I I think you know where I'm going with this. And in this piece of art, Henry Nouwen looks at Rembrandt's, not only his life, but the art to understand a little bit about the psychology here of all the characters. The father and the two sons, and the audience watching. But in this specific part, I want to talk about the brother, the older brother. Now, Rembrandt lost one son, two daughters, and a wife to death. So he had been through a lot of trauma, a lot of heartache. And he was able to look at all of these characters with sympathy and compassion and empathy. And he did that with the older brother too, the one who stayed home and was dutiful and responsible while the other one went and floundered and flaunted and effed whatever he wanted to ruins. And he came back and the father accepted him. And the brother is going, whoa, whoa, wait, I stayed here and did all the right things. There are model children and many of you ones tried to be the model children. You tried to be the apostle Paul in a sense, right? The, The character who does all the right things, follows the rules, then is struck down on the way to Damascus and is realizing like, oh, I actually wasn't doing it all the right way. Being a zealot, being dogmatic, actually needed to surrender to chilling out. Not being self-righteous, but being self-understanding, so you're not beating yourself up, but also other understanding. Now, I talked about my roommate, and, and he was... In a sense, at times, in our relationship, the older brother. 
and I would be the younger brother, kind of going up, out, screwing up, and and causing trouble, and he did some of the right things, and sometimes I brought him into it, and he got in trouble too, and sometimes he would pull me to that more righteous side, and there was a good balance there, but people who constantly feel judged by the older brother, it becomes annoying to highlight all of our weaknesses, to obsess about our shortcomings, no, how, no matter how benign, is a problem. And that's part of the, the issue is some of the, the things that a one will go after are such low-hanging fruit. They're not worth it. You're concentrating on things that aren't big enough for your time. You have to find how purpose and responsibility to the bigger picture, like eights do pretty well. And go after those things and not sweat as much of the small stuff. Now, Rick and I liberated each other, my buddy from college. We were able to, I think, with help from others and in our own relationship over the years, find ways to bring parts of each other out that were helpful to our growth. For me to find some actual restraint, you know, this is where the four goes to their high side of one. It's not surprising that I picked a friend who was one. Now, in stress, he goes to that four. But we found ways to inform each other. And we didn't know about the Enneagram till many years later. Ones need to find ways to unbridle to take off the restraints. Now, when you are in a very definitive place and you've been hurt, well, ones can be really rough and require you to apologize, get down on your hands and knees. Otherwise, you cannot get back into the fold. And this is a little bit of what was happening with the prodigal and the bolder brother. But the problem is the older brother is anti-instinctual. You know, us fours are pretty instinctual. Uh, the prodigal was pretty instinctual to the negative. But when you are so rule-bound and systematic and impose upon yourself so many restrictions that the over-control rules you, the only way to counter that is to find some ways to be more instinctual and let yourself go a bit. And so this is a follow-up to that lost childhood a bit. Unfortunately, there's this kind of uh, weird dynamic where the one, because they impose so much weight on themselves, have a tough time hearing the feedback that would help them. You guys can be very sensitive about getting feedback. So we want to help you understand yourself, and you have to do the work of being open and receptive. Now, what we can do to help you is maybe some empathy sandwiches. Start off with something good, give you the hard meat in the middle, and then end with something good to just soften the blow a little bit. This is how we have to work together. Everyone's backstory is complicated, and the one has to remember that. And we actually have to remember that when we're in relationship with the one, Because they can seem like nothing really bad happened in their life. They just do all the things right. But if we both remember that this is water, as David Foster Wallace talks about in his commencement speech, go find it on YouTube. It is a great piece of work about looking at the big plank in your eyes. About looking at your own stuff before you just look out at the world. Here's some quotes from Henry Nouwen in The Prodigal. It is clear that the hardest conversion to go through is the conversion of the one who stayed home. The lostness of the resentful saint is so hard to reach precisely because it is so closely wedded to the desire to be good and virtuous. It is a complicated world you guys live in once. Because the pursuit looks so good. (laughs) That it makes it confusing for you. But know this. If you are to grow and really grow healthy. It will be an indication of your growth. That your friend group will diversify. 
And the people that you surround yourself will be all kinds of folks with different kinds of ways of doing life and different kinds of funky stuff. And that you can work through your difficulty with it to get more and more understanding and empathetic. Don't let the predilection towards binary thinking rule your evaluations. And don't require people to be you. It would be an incredibly boring and quite diminishing world. (laughs) Always be pushing the pace towards this deeper connection with others. That is the call on you. To go from the brother that is pissed off that there was waste to a brother that is compassionate and open to the younger brother that has screwed things up. Cool? All right, let's move on. Oh, I'm doing this at the very right time. Everything is whipping up behind me. There's a valley here and the wind is blowing through the valley and it's stirring. You can see it back there. It's stirring up some chaos and isn't the world chaotic. Now, my whole set might fall apart at some point here, but I wanted to do this just at this moment because you guys are part of the idealist harmonic triad. And this part is called narrow paths. The ones have a narrow path. They want to see the world in a certain way and they want the world to be in a certain way. Not chaotic, not too windy, not too uh, filled with rage. The wind is filled with rage right now. It's slapping around back there and whipping through that valley. And as a harmonic group, well, I have to, I have to admit, I am part of this group. I'm a four, right? So it's the ones, the fours, and the sevens. And we all want the world to be a certain way in this idealistic sense to our benefit. You guys want to create structure, have a world that is structured and where people do the right thing. Us fours want an idealized version of the world through expression, creativity, and beauty. And the sevens want a world without pain. Just give us no pain so we don't have to deal with anything that's hard and heavy. And so we all idealize. And because of that, all of our paths can be a little bit narrow. What ones have to realize is your battle against reality, that things are messy, painful, disgusting at times, totally, totally unfair, that sometimes you have to move further towards that to get a better blend of this clean perfection thing that you've created and the dark shadowy side of the world. And I hate that you have to do that. Us fours are a bit more familiar with the darkness. We, we kind of come out of the womb thinking about death and darkness. And so as a therapist, you can tell me anything, anything. And I don't really flinch. Like I can really handle the ugliest stuff. There's a part of me that knows the world isn't right and never will be. And so you as ones, are kind of counter to that and have to realize that the world will end up jacked up. It will always be this way. Things will die and you will die if you don't admit that it will be jacked up. And this will actually relieve some tension for you. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to fix it all. I know that your desire is to say, what could it be? What could a perfect environment be? But I want to tell you this with sensitivity and compassion. And this isn't nihilism or uh, pessimism, actually. It's just realism that the world is far worse than you think it is. And actually far better. That's the trick. There's things that are so ugly going on right now in this very second all over the world that could cause you the desire to leave the world if you knew about them and watch them. And at the same time, there's so much beauty and so much goodness that it can take the pressure off you to have to be one of the ones who fixes things. So acceptance of this is difficult, I understand. It's difficult for us all, 
but maybe most so, most so for you, to deal with incremental growth and slow movement, not wholesale change, is part of your path of growth. That chipping away at things is okay. And for others to chip away at them and not change overnight is okay. To take your judgment away and let them be in the process. Now, one of the things I like to do, and I wanna put some disclaimers on this, is have my clients who are ones go watch some things or read some things that are really hard. So one of those things is docu-series. So I'm gonna just throw out four or five right now that might actually make you feel really uncomfortable and the grayness of them can leave you walking away from those films saying, ugh, I wanted a solution. I wanted something to win in the end. So these docu-series are The Keepers. It's really hard to watch, but I think a really good example of great journalistic work and people going after evil, but not totally winning. The Staircase, another docu-series. Making a Murderer is a good one. And City of Angels, City of Death. All four have very deep, deep darkness. But all four, I think, are those that can make you shift a little and feel discomforted. Now, I'm also going to recommend a writer that I just finished his work. So, so when I do the part on fire, on anger, I'm going to make a fire. And in that fire, I want you to think about uh, Bukowski a little bit. Somebody who uses his anger in his writing. Now, Bukowski isn't one of my favorite writers in the world, but I think he's really good. And I just finished the book, Ham on Rye. So I burn the pages in this episode on fire. Kind of a, a, an homage to him. And I do this often with books that I don't underline a lot. I just, I let, I let the feelings be there. And what I want you to do when you read, if not Bukowski, but something hard, something fiction, not just straight self-help, something that evokes emotion is after each chapter or, or take time after a couple pages to really figure out what's going on inside of you. What am I feeling? And you might get a feelings chart. I have feelings charts that I give to folks. And in those, we'll have different categories of emotions. So for anger, for example, there's hundreds of words from peeved to rage-filled. And after each chapter, you might just write an emotion that you're experiencing. And after you watch certain segments of these documentaries. You might just write a feeling down to get more in touch with that raw side, that real side of you. The virtue to anger for you guys is serenity. The world is messy, stop fighting, right? Deal with it, serenity. You don't have to have the tools. They don't all have to be in your toolbox. And serenity is some kind of almost surrender, like. I can't change this. Fantasy can't win. Idealism can't win. I can't change this thing. Hard for us to do in general, hard for ones to really do. And so getting in touch with your emotions, calling them out and letting yourself just feel is part of moving towards serenity. There's that classic moment in one of the Seinfeld episodes, I think it's called Serenity now, where uh, George's dad finds a solution to anger by just saying serenity now, serenity now. And then Kramer starts doing it and George starts doing it. And it's kind of a joke of like serenity now to just get rid of the anger. But no, we can actually move towards the anger, but know it better. Call it out by name and get a little bit more fine tuned with what we're feeling. So when we talk about serenity, we're also kind of in a synonymous way talking about patience that gradual progress, that incremental progress that I talked about. So I just want to think about a few things here is a lot of ones don't enjoy the ride. They're very concentrated on the destination, on the completion of a thing. So Teilhard de Chardin says, above all, trust the slow work of God. The slow work of God. The inner critic pushes you to move faster it governs you and oppresses you. But can you foster a mindset of a slow movement? 
It's like redwood trees. They grow very, very high, but their root system goes very wide, very wide, and it wraps around other roots because a wind, a storm would easily push down a tree that high. But what they do is they wrap hundreds of feet out around other root systems. And this takes a long time, a very long process of slow movement out, incremental movement out. Patience can be a good practice for a one to realize you don't have control. I don't know what that is, but I am going to have to operate some control right now myself. Okay, that lasted a little while. I had to cut off there for a second. Uh, things don't always go the way you want them to. This is not an idealized world, even in Switzerland, where everything seems to go right. Uh, but we have to realize that great things will take time. We can't hurry up too fast. Haste will get in the way. So another part of this idea of greening, or, or as I was talking about the redwood, is this idea of veriditas, veriditas, the greening of things. This, it's a photosynthesis. There is a readiness in plants to receive the sun and transform that sun into energy. Meister Eckhart says, what we plant in the soil of contemplation, we shall reap in the harvest of action. So for ones, taking the time to pause out, chill out, slow down, and enjoy the process. Now to enjoy the process, you often have to get in touch with your dark side, your weird side. And so this is one of the reasons I was talking about Bukowski. Because Bukowski had a really rough life. And he became very angry and aggressive in response to that. And so I like to use the quotes by him when I'm talking to ones to like ruffle their feathers a little bit because he's really hard to read because he is so raw, sexually raw, uh, aggressively raw. There is a part of him that's touching the very, very deep shadow of life in his writing to provoke emotion in you. And he says, some people never go crazy what truly horrible lives they must lead. He goes on to say this, understand me, I'm not like an ordinary world. I have my madness. I live in another dimension and I do not have time for things that have no soul. I do not have time for things that have no soul. Ones have to get pushed back by life a little bit to get some more character become more interesting, less boring, less upright. It's this perfect scene in Fight Club, where in Fight Club, they have to go and lose a fight. It's to develop character. It's to be humbled a bit and not have things go the way they want them to go, to get punched by a person that you could probably beat and let it happen. So I challenge you to go watch that scene in Fight Club where they have to go lose a fight. And both of these, this movie and Bukowski, are a bit raw. There's some vile parts of it. There's some disgusting things. There are some parts that really provoke a one. And I am not suggesting you go watch anything. You have your sensitivities and you have your history, your past. And some of these types of things might be too hard for you to watch. But I challenge you to, to go after the things that are hard for you so that you can develop more character and more patience and enjoy the slow ride in which you become more interesting. Not just having a narrow path, not just being an idealist. All right, on to the next part. To end, I want to leave you with the beauty and the clean, crisp air of Switzerland, but also juxtaposition it with the pressure and restriction you put on yourself. Sigmund Freud talked about being anal retentive. So this part's called anality. And it'll be a little bit weird to look at the beauty while I'm talking about how you restrict yourself. And what Freud was talking about was literally restricting the anus to hold in your crap. 
to be self-controlled, to get off on it. And in a sense, find some kind of control over your body. It's a kind of defense mechanism, that self-restriction, the internal judicial system that puts us on trial. Ernest Becker in his book, that is one of my favorite books of all time, The Denial of Death, says, man are literally split in two. People are split in two. They have an awareness of their own splendid uniqueness in that they stick out in nature with towering majesty. And yet they go back into the ground a few feet in order to blindly and dumbly rot and disappear forever. It is a terrifying dilemma to be in and to live with this painful contradiction. To be retentive is this desire for cleanliness, continual search for the unicorn of life perfect, clean, right, good. We are filthy humans, but can I restrict that? The refusal to produce bowel movements even. Punctuality, tightness, that we can be tyrants to ourselves, trying to avoid transgression and making it so important that we avoid it, that we carry the weight of all of this stuff inside of us, almost like constipation. In The Denial of Death, and I recommend this book for the nerdy ones of you, it's really thick and deep, but it really goes into that we were brought into this world right where we eject the crap. It is a complicated body that we have. And so the ones you have a tortured dissatisfaction with yourself. There is a constant self-criticism. And you want the impossible. Just like us fours, we, we have the idealism that we're pursuing of this great uniqueness. And yours is a pursuit of perfection, of being right and doing the things the right way. As Brecker says, whatever he does, he is stuck with himself, can't get securely outside of himself. There is a systematic self-restriction. The He says this too, the most one can achieve is a certain relaxedness and openness to experience that makes him less of a driven burden on others. Bukowski says this, the free soul is rare, but you know it when you see it, basically because you feel good, very good when you are near or with them. I love the quote by Bruce Springsteen when he says, I was told when I was a kid that I was the second coming of Jesus, and I was told I wasn't worth dirt. And I believe them both. And that is the, the, the thing that stirs the fire within me. Now, what we need to do, ones, is limit the amount that we feel like dirt. And have a balance of healthy knowing that we are created, beautiful, and majestic. Not to lord that over others, but to actually just experience it as something joy-filled that we can share. To die to the fear of falling and failing. To not have to have so much power over the world. Accepting it for what it is. Otherwise, we cut ourselves out and we don't expose, we don't stand out, we don't go ahead, and we compulsively hide away in this restrictive state. So in the denial of death, he goes on to say this, the anus and its incomprehensible repulsive product represents not only physical determination, determinism and boundness, but the fate as well of all that is physical, decay and death. I don't mean to scare you with this, but we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we protecting ourselves from? Is God or the universe that worried about the little Ways in which we're perfect? 
Or do we have to let that go? Otherwise, we become true hypocrites. We have to find trap doors because that pressure is too much. And we will quietly rebel against it. And some of us will do crazy things on the side. And some of us will fall into eating disorders and anxiety because we have put too much pressure on ourselves. Maybe you'll say, I am so dutiful that I deserve this this side thing that I do to get away. So I am challenging you at the end here, as we close, to really think about how much pressure you've put on yourself and that it doesn't matter all that much. No one really cares how great you have done in the moral and specifics of the world that you are protecting yourself from. Loosen up a little bit. It's a great challenge for one to loosen up for a bit and follow those words that Bukowski talks about. He's talking about a pursuit for a person of being a bit more free. The free soul is rare, but you know it when you see it, basically because you feel good, very good when you are near or with them. Let that be a challenge to you to be a bit more warm and loose so that people can be more free to be around you and less restricted because of worries that you will judge and critique. Cool? I'll close us out, but I hope you enjoyed Switzerland with me. I tried to give you a little bit of a different vibe than I usually do with my other numbers, and hopefully it worked. All right, guys, have a good one. All right, folks, so we are at the end here. I usually have a real brief conclusion, but in this, I'd like to just extend it a little bit. I hope you enjoyed Switzerland. And part of what I wanted to do here was slow you down a little bit. And even in not being just me and the camera, but offering some beauty, something for you to just enjoy the pleasures of life with. Ones can have a difficult time with it. That's why you need to move to the seven. And so when you're not really feeling chill, you know, or being experienced that way, That busy bee inside of you that's constantly going, going. That ant that needs to move, but sometimes doesn't find purpose. Is productive, but maybe not purposeful. And to do that, you need to lean into your seven, that high side of seven, to to indulge, to find guilty pleasures. You know, they are great entrepreneurs. They have pattern recognition. They're open to new experiences. And so that's another part of why I wanted to do this in a different place. This art of travel, movement towards travel. Maybe even by the book, The Art of Travel by Alain de Botton, where he talks about what kind of growth can be expedited in travel. You know, and the sevens are great at doing that. They're pleasure seekers. They, they move towards positivity, good vibes. And they make some bad decisions. You know, ones make really bad decisions when they are too tight and they're trying too hard to be good. And we talk about the trap door. When they do not de-idealize the world and idealize themselves or the process, there's a trap door in which something bad happens somewhere else. Maybe it's in just judging people, but maybe it's in some sexual sin, some kind of act that you do that is really secret. So I'm challenging you to wiggle and jiggle a little bit, sparkle and shine, you know, chill, have some fun, make some illogical moves in life, not be so careful and predictable. Maybe you try yoga and meditation, uh, music, dancing. Maybe you play with the arts a bit and creativity, lean towards the healthy part of four. But slow down. And again, I tried to slow us down here. (sighs) Take some breaths. Feel into something. You know, you might be less inclined towards hobbies, less inclined towards those things that bring you satisfaction because you're so concentrated on good deeds. Your to-do list has to be done. And then there's a to-do list for the to-do list. So minister to fun. Speak to fun. And oppress the voice that oppresses you. Or learn how to deal with it well. Be in communication with it. We have to uh, 
detach from the cruel voice inside. The voice that is constantly tell, telling you to be a good boy or a good girl, to choose clean, polished living, to, to be ordered and structured, but to foster something that actually says sin boldly, <laughs> move out and take some risks, be a little bit bad. So I hope I've challenged you to do that today. Again, my name is Drew. I hope you had fun in Switzerland. The next videos on the subtypes and the four and one in connection are going to be in Switzerland. And also try to do it a little bit different, but also I'm going to probably slow us down there too and have some of the beauty of Switzerland be shown to you. Again, if you need some help, give me a holler. Please subscribe. And as I say at the end of every video, everything is yet to be done. Everything. In the words of Rainar Marie Roca, enjoy this place. I hope you had a good time with me.